नमस्कार वेलकम टू प्रकाश फ्रॉम बी सिक्स आई एम प्रकाश जोग लास्ट टाइम वी एट सीन हाउ वी ईट फूड एंड इट गेट्स एब्सॉर्ब इन टू ब्लड एंड वॉट गेट्स एब्सॉर्ब इज न्यूट्रिय एंड टू अ वेरी लार्ज एक्सटेंट ग्लूकोज विच इज आर मेन सोर्स ऑफ एनर्जी the nutrients could be a little more complex molecules more complex than glucose itself since blood flows in all parts of the human body these nutrients and glucose can be transferred everywhere in the body wherever it is required the presence of this glucose in blood causes our pancreas to release insulin in our blood it is because of this insulin that glucose molecules can enter within every individual cell there is a gatekeeper which senses the presence of insulin and allows the sugar molecule not sugar but glucose molecule to enter into our cells and within our cells there is another sub part of the cell which is known as a mitochondrion many a times it's not just one mitochondrion that is present but there could be multiple of them so they are known as mitochondria and these are called the power houses of our cells because what they do is oxidize whatever glucose has been received and cause release of energy but energy in what form to understand that we have to understand some more intermediate steps so we will talk of distinct parts and then link them up to finally see how we get our energy in order to break down this complex molecules we have to do opposite of what was done in photosynthesis photos light energy was used to synthesize uh, many atoms like carbon and nitrogen and hydrogen and oxygen and phosphorus and sulfur into more and more complex molecules and the energy in its chemical form got stored now i am doing exactly the opposite i have already come down up to the level of glucose and what was glucose we talked of some time back c 6 h 12 o 6 that means six carbon atoms and six water molecules now if i have to break up all these bonds i must convert this carbon into carbon dioxide to do that i need oxygen so the necessary oxygen is brought to the cells by another compound which we all know of it is known as hemoglobin hemoglobin is a part and parcel of every blood cell that we know of it's a pretty complex molecule it's actually a metallo protein just for fun i'll tell you how complex this molecule is uh, it consists of carbon hydrogen nitrogen oxygen sulfur and iron atoms is that enough no it's not that simple how many of these atoms is equally interesting and that is 2952 carbon atoms 4464 hydrogen atoms 
nitrogen atoms 812 oxygen atoms 8 sulfur atoms and 4 iron atoms all this is just one single molecule pretty complex and it's present in every living organism that is on the surface and that tends to use oxygen all mammals use oxygen all other insects and plants use oxygen and for most of them hemoglobin is the one that helps us to get that oxygen in what happens is this fe that is present inside fe is iron it has a tendency to lock on to oxygen so when the blood after being pumped from the heart reaches the lungs this oxygen from outside through osmosis comes in contact with the blood that is within our lungs we know that our lungs are just two full air sacs why air sacs because there is one pipe wind pipe that goes in and what it does is it branches out and it branches out into more and more and more branches and at the end of each of these branch there is a small sac so when i breathe in that air goes in and all these sacs open out and on the other side of the sacs are blood vessels that have already reached there and by osmosis between the thin walls of the sac and the arteries on the other side or the blood vessels on the other side oxygen diffuses through similar to osmosis that we talked of some time back and this diffused oxygen causes this hemoglobin to get converted into oxy hemoglobin that means oxygen is hooked on to that hemoglobin molecule if i want more oxygen it is quite obvious that i must have more and more surface area coming in contact with the blood vessels and the oxygen outside that i am taking in from air and so the sacs must be very small and must be very many in number and the branching must take place to a very large extent uh if you take a piece of cauliflower you can understand how this branching takes place uh suppose look at this so this is like the original line that comes in and every branch breaks up and ends in a sac sacs are going to be bigger than this but that's how the net amount of surface area of the whole thing has increased to a very large extent and these blow up enlarge in size and the surface area then results into the blood coming in contact with the parts of the surface the oxygen that is outside in the lungs in the bag outside gets in contact with the hemoglobin and converts it into oxy hemoglobin and then this blood through our heart gets pumped throughout the body wherever it is required this is typically what is known as oxygenated blood the one that carries oxygen to the variety of parts in the body where the energy has to be released so it reaches there and what does it do six carbon atoms get attached to six oxygen atoms but they are o2 that means there are ideally 12 atoms or six molecules and the combination results into co2 but how many six of them so six co2 or carbon dioxide molecules are produced and the water that is there which is again six molecules is also let free in the process some energy is released 
but that energy is not released directly what happens to it i am going to come to immediately so what happens you have excess amount of carbon dioxide that is released in the mitochondria and there is water that is released and i can't just keep it there so it has to be thrown out so what hemoglobin does is the oxygen is already gone carbon dioxide attaches back and it is carried back to our lungs and the water vapor along with it along with water molecules and that's why in school we have studied when we breathe out we are giving out carbon dioxide and water vapor and when we inhale we are taking in that oxygen not all oxygen from air is taken in because the time span is not enough for all that to get in but only about 4% out of that total 21% gets into the blood and is carried further and this process continues throughout our life and that's how blood gets oxygenated and breaks down that sugars lower part which is glucose into carbon dioxide and water vapor plus that energy and then what happens to that energy then comes the next step there is a particular compound which is in the mitochondria and in every possible cell in our body and it's known as atp adenosine triphosphate adenosine is a nitrogen base which is naturally one of the nucleic acids that i just mentioned some time back let's not make it more complicated there is a nitrogen linked part which is that adenosine and then there are special sugar molecules and this these sugar molecules are known as ribose sugar and as i said adenosine triphosphate which means that there has to be phosphate molecules but they are three in number so this is atp adenosine triphosphate if instead of three there are two of them it is known as adp adenosine diphosphate there is a possibility that there could be amp also adenosine monophosphate just remember that you know these you have heard of these words what's more important is to realize that it is the difference in that 3 and 2 which is everything that we are interested in whenever i talk of atp that means three phosphates it's obvious that there are three phosphate molecules that are linked up and this is like a compressed spring the instant this bond of the third one is broken one of the phosphates is released and it becomes adp adenosine diphosphate so the spring releases and it becomes a little free and remember right from uh, your ball pen springs what happens when the spring is compressed there is energy stored in it the instant the spring expands that energy comes out and is released so every spring that expands is going to release energy the same thing is going to happen in case of atp so when atp converts to adp it releases that energy and the spring expands now realize one more step if i can compress this spring back again all that i have to do is to attach that third phosphate molecule back again and adp will get converted back into atp and it will store all that energy so what is adp and atp doing when atp becomes adp it releases energy and when it goes back into atp energy gets stored so now 
many people call this ADP as the currency of energy. The reason is very simple. When it goes to a molecule where work is to be done, ATP gets converted into ADP and all that released energy is given to the muscles and the muscles do all their functions. But that's not all that happens. When ATP is converted into ADP, the energy that is available can be utilized for doing mechanical work in terms of exchange of certain ions on either sides of the cell. It can also generate ion change implies difference in voltage. That means it will result into small signals of electricity and these are nothing but the nerve impulses that are available. And when such nerve impulses are available, what will happen to muscles? They will contract and when the, the impulse disappears, they will expand. That's what I am doing now. So every time I do this, some muscles are contracting and some muscles are expanding. And when I am talking, the same thing is happening. And at every stage, this ATP is getting converted into ADP and that energy is being utilized. And then this is carried back to every cell's inner part, which is that mitochondria I talked of. And that mitochondria uses that energy that was available from burning glucose, which converted into six carbon dioxide and six water molecules plus that energy. That energy is used to bind phosphate molecules to the ADP. So ADP gets converted into ATP. It is believed, calculated and proven that ideally for every glucose molecule that is split up, 34 ATP molecules are produced. They did a lot of research on this later on and realized that there were some energy losses involved. So for all technical purposes, it's around 29 or 30 molecules of ATP that are produced. So realize what is happening within that mitochondria. Every glucose molecule that dissociates or breaks up because of oxygen being added produces 30 ATP molecules from ADP. So what are you doing? You are compressing that spring and getting it ready. And then your body cells transfer this ATP to wherever it is wanted. And the spring is released and the work is done either in, because of exchange of ions. And it results into those signals which communicate from our brain right to every part of our body and to muscles which do all the activity and all other sort of communications to various parts of the body to release various types of um, secretions or enzymes or other material and carry out every possible function in the body. This cycle of converting ADP into ATP and ADP into ATP and ATP into ADP. This goes on every second in our body. And this is typically referred to as the ATP cycle. For those who are from science, I'll just remind you that actually there is also a citric acid cycle related to this. But let's not go into that. That's a bit too, too complicated. What else is happening? There is that hemoglobin CO2 cycle that is going on. The carbon dioxide is going being pumped out. And there is that oxygen cycle that is also going on. So all these cycles are going on simultaneously. But what is the true source of energy then? ATP to ADP and back again. How much? It is believed that in a human body, the recycling of ATP and ADP in a day is as much as your own weight. So if I am 72 kg, 72 kilograms of ADP, ATP conversion takes place in my day, body throughout the day. Otherwise, where am I going to get all this energy from? 
how am i talking how am i looking at things how are the signals from my eye going to my brain and being interpreted how am i doing all these handshakes and other stuff everything <coughs> even this coughing is associated with adp atp transfer so finally friends what has happened photosynthesis stored energy put it in food stuff majority of it was glucose to complex sugars to proteins and lipids and minerals and vitamins we as humans consumed it we broke it down and broke it down and converted it into glucose once more the glucose was carried with the help of insulin to the mitochondria there carbon dioxide and water added on and were obtained from the glucose molecule and for every one glucose molecule 30 atp molecules were formed again and in the process what we have is energy stored springs that went to the different parts of the body resulting into muscle contraction or relaxation or sending of electrical impulses or signals and this release of energy in the form of ions resulting into very small voltages are the electrical signals which our body is utilizing for everything that's how energy finally gets used it started from the sun and every form of work that i do is the same this then is the hemoglobin cycle the atp cycle the food cycle the carbon dioxide cycle all of them linked to each other that's how we get our energy but let me remind you not all food got used not all animals use all the food there is a lot of wastage and nature doesn't like to waste anything so what happens to all that energy that is still there that my dear friends is something we will talk of in time to come if you like whatever i have said please like and subscribe to this channel tell your friends that you now know how you finally get your energy till we meet again namaskar